I have the privilege of being in almost in a different church every weekend of the year because God has given me that kind of ministry. And I'm delighted to be there, but you need to know I've been looking forward to being here this weekend. First of all, to be reunited with Joel, who I have great admiration for, and uh, we have become very good friends. But also, the reason I'm delighted to be here is I can say things here that I can't say in many churches. Number one, you have an awesome pastor. Yes, awesome pastor. You have a great board of elders. Yes. And you have a great staff. And only God grows the church, and God's doing that here, and that's not happening in many churches in our nation. Do you realize this year, over 40 people have professed faith in Jesus Christ through the life of this congregation? Do you realize that this year, yes, yeah, you have grown over 20%. You have people involved in ministry. You're reaching out to the city. And I don't get the chance on a lot of weekends to speak to churches where that's happening. So I've been looking forward to coming. In fact, I really only have one disappointment this weekend. And that is that I couldn't bring my wife, Teresa, with me to meet you and for you to meet her. Not only is she an awesome woman, but she's a beautiful woman. Now, any husband who's wise says that. <laughs> but I can prove it. Almost every time we're out in public, an airport, a mall, whatever, someone walks up to her and says, has anyone told you, you look like Sophia Loren? Now, for those of you who are 45 and younger, you have no idea who I'm talking about. But for those of you who are older, you realize I married up. Okay. In fact, if I could use a football metaphor, I have outkicked my coverage <laughs> at that point. And when we're getting ready to go out for that special event, and she disappears as all women do to get ready, and she reappears, the dress fits perfectly, the accessories match, her hair is just perfect. I look at her and I say, you know, image is everything. And she laughs, and I laugh. Because we know that's not true. Those of us in this nation, we have watched over the last decades as companies have projected an image of honesty and truthfulness and integrity have been proven false, and they have been hypocritical, and sometimes their executives have been forced to go to prison because the image and the essence didn't go together. But let me turn it around. Essence without image seldom accomplishes much. That's also why companies spend millions and millions of dollars on image. I'm told I need a truck that is ram tough. I'm told by a little green amphibian that I need their insurance. If my digital equipment doesn't have a half-eaten piece of fruit on it, it's no good. <laughs> I'm told that my athletic equipment has to have that swish on it. You see, the reason why companies spend millions on image is they realize that image projects hope. You see, I hope if I buy that product, if I avail myself of that service, that what the image says will come true. Because you see, hope is crucial. In fact, the Bible says there's three big ideas in Scripture. Faith, love, and hope. Now, Paul, when he writes about that, says that love is most important. The writer to the book of Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God. But hope is what keeps us going. As they interviewed those prisoners who had been held in those Nazi death camps, 
Obviously, the prisoners who were killed had no choice in what happened to them. But those who made up the infrastructure of that camp and kind of kept it going and hung in there to the end, they realized that many of those prisoners had killed themselves by escaping, knowing they would get shot or throwing themselves on the electrified fence. But those who survived to the end still had a dream of a book they wanted to write, a concert they needed to play, a grandchild they had never seen, they knew existed somewhere in the world, and they wanted to hug that grandchild at least once. And it was that hope that kept them going. The Bible's way of talking about hope is vision. In fact, the Bible says without vision, people perish doesn't mean that we die it just means that the soul withers up like dust and is blown away and we say where in the world are we gone and as I work with church after church after church I find that many churches really have no vision in fact often as I walk into particularly smaller congregations their vision is really I hope the church remains viable enough that when I die I can have my funeral there I remind them that's not a great vision. Minimally, it takes four to carry a coffin. Somebody's going to have to turn out the lights. Who's it going to be? And that's a problem. Other churches have too many visions. And people come and say, Pastor, we need to do this. And others say, no, we need to go this direction. And others, no, we, and, and like horses pulling in a different direction, nothing happens. But there's a bigger problem than no vision or too many visions. It's an incomplete vision. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. What does it mean to have a vision that is really the fulfillment of what God sees as vision? To do this, I want to look at what many people refer to as the real Lord's Prayer. You'll remember the night that Jesus was going to die the next day, he had a meal with his friends. When the meal was over, they left the city, went into a garden, and Jesus went off by himself and he began to pray. And in that prayer, he prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for you and me. I just wanna look at the two requests that Jesus prayed for, for himself. Look as I read from John chapter 17 verses 1 and 2. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. Jesus said, Father, would you glorify me? Now, what Jesus means by the word glorify is, Father, will you have people know me, like me, follow me, honor me? When I tell you that our five grandchildren are exceptional. Yours may be average, (laughs) but ours are exceptional. I'm glorifying my grandchildren. When you say to someone, you really need to try that restaurant, that is a great restaurant, you're glorifying that restaurant. You should see that movie. Uh, You should go there for a vacation. We are glorifying what we're talking about. And Jesus said, I want people to do that for me. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but you realize that when Jesus came here to earth the first time, most of the people in the world didn't even know he had been born, lived, died, was raised from the dead, went back to heaven. Most people didn't know that. And I've often wondered, when Jesus went back to heaven, how many people were actually disciples of Jesus? Now, I went to seminary to learn how to exaggerate. So let's assume that when Jesus went back to heaven, there's at least 10,000 people on the earth who were followers of Jesus. I think that's a high number, but let's assume. I mean, we know he preached, he fed 5,000, but when he preached, a bunch of them left. He did preach the 500 after the resurrection, but let's suppose there were 10,000. Do you realize that 21 centuries later, Christianity 
is the number one faith in the world. Sociologists say if you could take the seven and a half billion people in the world and put them in one place and say, how many follow Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, whomever, the somewhere between 35 to 40 percent of the world's population would say, we follow Jesus. Now, you and I know that many of them would not be Christians the way you and I would define a Christian, but at least their faith allegiance is with Jesus Christ. In 1860, the world's largest faith was Buddhism. In 2019, the world's largest faith is Christianity. Not only is Christianity the number one faith in the world, but since World War II, it has been the fastest growing faith in the world. Now, in the last 18 months, Islam has caught up with new converts, but like two people running a race, Christianity and Islam are out front of everybody else. Missiologists estimate that 30,000 people a day in Latin America become a brand new disciple of Jesus. The same number is used of China. India, which about a quarter of a century ago, the estimate was that 1% of India was Christian. Today, the estimate is that almost 25% of India is Christian. When you see what God is doing in the Middle East and on Iran and Iraq and Vietnam and in other places, the church is booming. Often when I work with churches, I say to them, would you like to grow? And churches say, yes, we'd like to grow. And then invariably somebody says, but we don't want to become a mega church. And anymore, I just say, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. But if you don't like large churches, you don't want to go to heaven. Because after 21 centuries, the Bible says there will be a day when an uncountable number of people will bow their knee and say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus said, Father, would you glorify me? And the Father answered that request. The second request is found in chapter 17, verse 5, where we read, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. In other words, Jesus said, would you give me back my glory? Same word, different context. Now, this church, I realize many of you are very biblically literate. And you know that when you read the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we are told an awful lot about Jesus. But the one thing we're not told is what does Jesus look like? We don't know whether he was tall, whether he was short, the length of his hair, whether his features were fine or coarse. We have no idea what Jesus looked like. But we all know what Jesus looks like. We've seen the pictures. He was constantly posing. <laughs> you can just see this shot. Guys, get on one side of the table, crowd in, because we got to get you in the frame. You know, this is a picture. Or, or look at this picture. Uh, when, uh, when I was growing up, there was a big picture of Jesus like this every Sunday behind the pasture. He's got the long California surfer hair. He's got the well-groomed sheep in his arms, you know. And if I was in the third grade and some kid said to me, what's Jesus look like? I said, come here to church. We got his picture. You can see what Jesus looks like. Okay. Or, or look at this picture. Uh, I think this one was done with an iPhone. I'm not, I'm not sure at this point. Okay. Or look at this picture. Now, you know and I know that most of these pictures were painted by the artists in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. They were not painting what Jesus looked like. They were painting the image of who Jesus is. And I need those images. When you read in scripture about the throne room of God, I don't know about you, but I find it scary. I find it intimidating. Lights and angels and noise and just this, all this stuff going on. And God understood that. And so God the Father said, I'm going to send Jesus who will be my icon. Years ago, most of us had what we called iconoscopes in our houses. They were called television tubes. 
and a television tube, when you watch TV, you realize that the person on the screen, now, you know, when I had TV growing up, the images were that big. Now they're this big. But when you look at that image, you say, oh, that's not a real person. That was done in a studio. That was done in a back lot. Those are images. And the Bible says that's God's image to us, Jesus. I mean, I need to see someone who is all-powerful, all-knowing, who also got hungry, who got thirsty, whose friends turned on him. Because I can, to some degree, identify with that Jesus. The older I get, the more I realize that life is unfair and it's unjust. And when that happens, I need Jesus, who is that image of a shepherd, who wants to put his arms around me and hug me and say, it's okay, I've got you. I need that image of Jesus. Or the image that's on the screen now, which we just observed in the Lord's table of how Jesus, who's fully God, fully human, went to that cross and God took the punishment for your sin and my sin and put it on Jesus and he died for me. I need that image of Jesus. But if that's the only image I have, I have an incomplete vision of what Jesus is and what he wants to do. We do have a description of what Jesus looks like in the Bible. Follow along as I read that description. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. The Apostle John, as a martyr, was on the island of Patmos as a prisoner. It's Sunday morning, and all of a sudden he hears this voice that sounds like rushing water, and he turns. And he sees Jesus. And I don't know about you, but the way he describes Jesus, I seldom ever think of Jesus looking like that. The head and hair like white as wool, the face that shines like the sun, the feet that glows like bronze in a furnace. But Jesus said, Father, glorify me. And the Father did that. Then Jesus said, Father, give me back my glory. And I want to suggest to you that for 21 centuries, Jesus has not looked like most of the pictures. If anything, he may look more like this picture. When John saw Jesus, he was standing in a circle of seven candlesticks, each with a candle in it, and each candle was lit. And Jesus with that voice says, John, those seven candles represent seven congregations. Today we know those congregations are located in what we really call the country of Turkey. John had probably been in all of those congregations. He had probably preached in all of those congregations. And Jesus says, in a moment, I'm going to dictate a letter to every one of those congregations. And in the letter, I'm going to say something different because every congregation is unique. But the message will be the same. As long as those congregations do what I want, their candle will burn brightly. If they stop 
doing what I want. I will take their candle and blow it out. Within three to 400 years, all of those candles were blown out. Because you see what Jesus said is the reason why these congregations exist is not for themselves. They exist to reach my world to tell people about Jesus. And when they stop doing that, I will take their candle and blow it out. Christianity is the number one faith in the world. Along with Islam, it's the fastest growing faith in the world. But there's three places where the church of Jesus Christ is dying. Europe, North America, and Australia and New Zealand. Take our nation. 50 years ago, we had about a half a million congregations meeting every weekend. Today, there's about 320,000. 4,000 churches a year close, they die. And many of those churches, like you, believe in Jesus, believe the Bible, preach the gospel, but they're dying. And the reason they're dying is because most Christians believe that the church is for me. And every Christian all across our nation comes to church every Sunday as a consumer. In fact, most Christians sit in church like Russian ice skating judges. That song was an 8.5. Those announcements were a 1.2. Joel hopes the sermon's a 10.0 with points added for artistic merit. And if the score is high enough, we come back. If it begins to decline, we complain. And if nobody listens to our complaint, here's what we do. We shop for another church. And the reason why our churches are dying is because they're being run for the Christians. And God is going throughout our nation. <sighs> Blowing out candles. Folks, the reason why your church is growing, the reason why you have seen over 40 people this year make a profession of faith is because you're different than most churches. Because you have made the decision, rather in recent times, to say it's not about us. But we are here to change Merced. We are here to change that world. And that image of Jesus, on one hand, is the judge of the church. But there's something else this image tells me about Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'll follow this Jesus anywhere. This Jesus is going to win. Okay. For the last quarter of a century, I've been going every year to Australia to work with churches. And for the last 15 years, I've been working with the Salvation Army. I really didn't know anything about the Salvation Army until I went to Australia to begin to work with them. William and Catherine Booth, when they were in London in their church, they began to be concerned about the poor, the powerless, and the resourceless in their community. And so they went out and began to reach them for Jesus. They brought them to their church, and their church would not let the poor sit in the worship center. That was when you had to pay for a pew. They didn't have any money, so they made them sit in a foyer. And so William and Catherine Booth said, we're going to start a new church, and we're going to call it the Salvation Army. We're going to be about three things, soup, soap, and salvation. And the army started. The army got to Australia in the year 1900 in the city of Adelaide. And God did a miracle. Within 10 years, there are Salvation Army churches all across the nation of Australia, from Brisbane to Perth to Sydney to Melbourne, many of them churches of 500, 1,000. They'd go into little towns. So many people would come to Jesus. The bars would close. The brothels would close. The gambling casinos would close. And the the army people were persecuted because of all these businesses closing. But when I got there 15 years ago, here's what they said to me. They said, Paul, we're doing great at soup. We're doing great at soap. But our churches are dying. They said the average size congregation in our nation is now 52 people on a weekend. 
used to be 500, used to be 1,000, but there's only 52. They said, do you think we can see God do something? I said, yeah. But I said, you got to realize, you are awesome when it comes to the great commandment. You are horrible when it comes to the great commission. You've stopped making disciples for Jesus. And if you'll do that, the church will begin to grow. And by the way, that's happening. About five years ago, I was invited to a church, they call them a corps, Salvation Army Corps, in Sydney, Australia, in an area called Campsie. Campsie is the most multicultural section of Sydney. In fact, when I would go out of, the, out of their building to go to lunch, I was the only white person on the street. Everybody else was from Asia, from Africa, from the Middle East. I was the only white person. Now this church, which used to be five or six hundred, was down to 70 old white people. And it didn't look at all like the community. And they said, Paul, they, they said, Monday through Saturday, everybody comes in. They come in for immigration help, they come in for food, they come in for rehab, they come in for all kinds of things. Sunday we open our doors and nobody comes. He said, but we want to reach this community. I said, okay. Number one, you got to realize you're disobedient. You're not doing what Jesus says. You're doing great at the great commandment, but not the great commission. They said, we'll confess that sin. And they did. And then they said, uh, but we want to grow. I said, where do you want to grow? They said, we want to grow right here. I said, you got a problem. They said, what's the problem? I said, you're too pale. Everybody else is dark and you're all white and kind of wrinkly. You know, they said, well, what do we do? Now, I got to tell you about Salvation Army worship. Like in most churches, their worship is as rigid as can be, but it's just different. Okay. And I've been to almost 100 services. I've never been to a Salvation Army church in the U.S., but I've been to about almost 100 in Australia. And in this church, every Sunday on the platform, this is the way worship went. Sitting in chairs facing this direction were 10 old men in uniforms, because when you join the church, you get a uniform. 10 old men in uniforms playing brass instruments. Now, you know how young people are just grooving to hear brass music. Okay. The platform is so big, there used to be 100 old men, but they've all died. There's just 10 old men, and we're glad they have enough wind to make noise. Okay. Sitting on this side of the platform are 10 old women in uniforms, because historically the men were in the band and the women were the choir, they were the songsters. And sitting between them were the husband and wife officer team, so every Sunday on the platform were 10 or 20 old people, all white, and the communities all these different beautiful colors. And so I said to them, if you wanna grow here, what people see on the platform is what the congregation will become. So one of the prescriptions I gave them was, by such and such a date, half the people sitting on the platform every Sunday must be under the age of 40 and cannot be white, even if you have to hire people to sit there. <laughs> I went back to the States, I thank God for that because I didn't know what to do. I knew what needed to happen. These old men, who now lived out in the suburbs, put their uniforms on during the week because they only wore them on Sunday normally. And they went down into the Camp C area and they began to go all the schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. And they said, we're here to give free music lessons. Who would like music lessons? 10 year olds, 12 year olds, 15 year olds, 18 year olds raising, well the women heard about it, said see if there's any girls that want free voice lessons. In about two months, they have 40 or 50 youngsters every Tuesday night coming to their building and they're giving them free music lessons. Now these, these old men had played in bands in competition around the world, they were good musicians. And things seemed to be going well, but then about two months into it, there's a problem. And some of the Asian parents show up and they said, we're glad you're giving our children free music lessons, but you're teaching them brass. 
We don't want them to learn brass. I mean, we want a violin and flute because they could see their children one day playing at the Sydney Opera House. Now, these old men who all their lives, the tradition of the Salvation Army is the band, has to decide, are we going to be the band or the orchestra? And they decide to be the orchestra. And then they take these Young people, they divide them in two groups. There's some boys and girls in this group, some boys and girls in this group. And they said, how about if every other week you sit on the platform and you play or sing with us? Well, these kids said, sure. Now, when your child's sitting on a platform playing or singing, that's a concert. Who comes to concerts? Parents, grandparents, if you're Asian, great, great grandparents, great, great, great grandparents. I mean, you know, they start coming. There was a park across the street. Sunday morning, the park was filled with people from the community. It was the only green space in that part of the city. I said, you know, this building is not the church. We're the church. So if they won't come to you, you go to them. In the next six months, do two services in the park. Serve food, because people show up for food. They had to get all kinds of permits, all kinds of permission, but they did the service. In fact, the second service, the pastor told me, ladies, he said, Paul, we're just getting ready to start our service, and these African people show up and say, can we play our drums and dance? He said, I guess so. He said, to this day, I have no idea what they did, but they played. Two years later, I'm preaching at that church, same weekend. Used to be 70 white people. When I got up to preach that Sunday, there's 168 people in church. And on the wall are the 37 flags of the 37 nationalities that are now part of the congregation. When the pastor did the children's story, there was a young father holding this three-year-old kid, just a boy that you say, that kid's got to be in the movies. Just, you couldn't take your eyes off him. Afterwards, the pastor said, did you see that child? I said, yeah. He said, uh, the mother, father, boy and girl immigrated here from the country of Nepal. As far as we know, they're the first people from Nepal to come to Jesus in the Salvation Army in our church. Two years ago, the representative from the Campsie area stood up in Canberra, the nation's capital, in Parliament and talked about how the whole area was being revitalized and how the Salvation Army Corps was one of the leading factors in doing that. Who does that? It's the glorified, resurrected Lord who has come to your church and brought you a pastor who knows what to do. You have leaders who have stood and you have said, we're not going to be about us, we're going to be about Merced. That happens when a church has a complete image of Jesus. I need the image of the God human who cares for me, who died for me. But I got to remember, he said, Father, give me back my glory. And the Father did that. And you and I get to follow the glorified, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. That's who our Savior is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you did for us through Jesus. That you sent him to die. And he paid price that we might have redemption and be redeemed out of our state of life and our sin to be your children thank you for glorifying his name we get to know him but thank you for giving him back his glory because we get to follow him may this church represent a complete vision of jesus to this community for the sake of lost souls 
and for your glory and honor. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.